certainly an interesting start to this Sunday. Much of the viewing area shaken by a 5.1 magnitude earthquake. Chris, you are tracking this earthquake. Just uh, tell us some of the significance about this earthquake. This is rather large for our viewing area. Well, Kendall, first off, this is historic right now. This is a significant event just because of how far that it reached. And this often happens because there's fault lines, there's little tremors that this can follow. But we're also not done with this. There's going to be aftershocks over the next couple of days. In a matter of seconds, a historic earthquake felt across the eastern half of the country struck this small town. The riots, the pandemic, now an earthquake. Each neighbor in Sparta now adds a natural disaster to their 2020 memories. We are experiencing not just one earthquake this year, but many. The fault lines in our society shudder and split open. Fault lines have marked our response to the pandemic. The virus has killed more than quarter million people. Affecting de manera desproporcionada a las comunidades negra, latinx y nativa. Hourly essential workers risk their lives every day while millions of other workers can zoom in month after month. Many more have lost jobs and are struggling to find work. Debates about wearing masks and social distancing grind us down and divide us. Fault lines connected to race have erupted and racial justice marches continue to shake our cities and towns. Protests against the killings of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and so many more have often squared off with police and counter protesters. Battles have sprung up over how we tell our country's story and we wrestle with the impact and role of symbols from the past in our nation today. And the economy is similarly divided. The stock market soared to record highs while tens of millions of Americans lost their jobs. Home prices shot up as an eviction crisis built for renters. And low-wage workers desperately tried to get unemployment insurance, while higher-paid employees were mostly untouched. All these fault lines, and we haven't even mentioned the environment, education, and the digital divide, and so many other issues of concern and consequence. How do we find hope in this time? How do we find hope? How do we address the impact of what has been revealed by these tremors and convulsions? ¿Cómo encontramos esperanza? How can we connect across our differences and respond with courage? How do we find hope? How do we find hope? How do we find hope? How, How do, do we, we find, find hope? hope? Good morning. I'm Byron Hawkins, and on behalf of our board, I welcome you to our 2020 Stakeholder Breakfast. Yes, it's a breakfast, even though we're not all together. And like the rest of our programs at CBI this year, we could not and we would not cancel this event due to the pandemic. I vividly remember the first time I left, I felt an earthquake. I was a freshman at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. Luckily for me, it was a small one and the tremors only lasted a few minutes, but the anxiousness lasted for weeks. My roommate was right. The anxiety eventually faded until the next fault line slipped and the shaking started again. The things we let divide us are fault lines in our communities. The events of this year filled me with the same uneasiness I felt more than 25 years ago. But unlike geological fault lines that, can't pre that, can't prevent, that we can't prevent from activation, we have the capacity to prevent inequity and remove bias and defeat racism. Our program today is truly a unique CBI experience designed to equip all of us with the knowledge, skills, and courage for the journey ahead. We have more than 1,000 registered vir virtual participants. Think about that, 1,000 people from across our community 
and some other parts of the country. If we each wake up, interrupt, and step up, imagine the change we could bring to the communities we live in. When you feel moved this morning, step up. Jot a note on your doodle sheet. And also, consider making a gift to support the work of CBI. Trust me, it's easier than buying groceries online. Simply click the donate button on your screen or go to our website, cbicharlotte.org slash donate. Thank you and over to you, Rick. Thanks, Byron. And good morning, everyone. I'm Rick McDermott and with Byron, I serve on the CBI Board of Directors. On behalf of all of us, welcome to this year's Stakeholders Breakfast. Fault lines, they exist in our ground and can, they can impact all of us, regardless of whether or how we acknowledge them. But if we wake up to understand our fault lines and we equip ourselves to step up and interrupt them, our community will thrive. Thank you for joining us this morning as we explore this theme and consider how we can use ourselves to influence for change. I'd like to offer special thanks this morning to our presenting sponsor, Wells Fargo, whose commitment to CBI has been unwavering. Wells Fargo has been the presenting sponsor of our stakeholders breakfast for the past 11 years, and their very own Kendall Phillips is serving as the co-chair of this year's event. We appreciate their consistent participation in all of our programs. Thanks to Wells Fargo and to Kendall. Thank you to all of our sponsors. You can see the names and logos of these generous community-minded companies and organizations on your screen and at our website. The financial commitment of these organizations makes it possible for CBI to continue its work of giving people and organizations the knowledge skills, and courage to fight bias, remove barriers to opportunity, and to build a more equitable and just Charlotte Mecklenburg. I'm really excited this year to announce that this is the largest number of sponsors ever for a CBI Stakeholders Breakfast event, which speaks not only to the importance of CBI's mission, but specifically to the focus of this year's breakfast, shining a light on the fault lines in our community. Thanks again for joining us this morning. I know you're going to enjoy our program, and I'd now like to pass the mic to Diane English, CBI's Executive Director. Diane? Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Rick. Good morning to each of you. I bring greetings from CBI's team, Annetta, Christy, Megan, and Pat, as we truly connect across distance this December morning. You've already heard mention of the phrase we've highlighted our last two breakfasts, namely, wake up, interrupt, step up, something we champion for promoting awareness and change within ourselves, our organizations, and our communities. In 2020, perhaps, we should reorder this triplet to say, interrupt, wake up, step up. CBI has been working hard to pivot and respond to the interruptions we have all experienced and to respond to the demands for social justice that have filled our streets. Our two flagship leadership programs, LDI and LU40, went virtual, and we were able to not only graduate those two classes, but have recruited for the next two. Our Equity Impact Circle program, where a small group of people participate in a series of sessions together adapted very easily to our new virtual space. And we can proudly say we even have virtual bus tours. Since March, what has taken place and been revealed yet again in our country, our community, and how we and others live our lives has been profoundly marked by interruptions. We are asked in new and hauntingly familiar ways to wake up to who is burdened and who benefits and why. To determine how we, individually and collectively, organizationally and system-wide, will step up and acknowledge the fault lines we see and experience. The fault lines that need to be addressed, interrupted and transformed so that we can do what is ours to do while the opportunity is all around us. 
So, in that hope, we gather together today to learn from, to inspire, and to challenge one another. CBI equips people to make change. So today, I am proud to say that except for our national special guest speaker, Nicholas Kristoff, everyone you will hear from is a CBIer. And if, like me, you doodle while you're listening, use our agenda placemat to jot down your thoughts in words and pictures, and be prepared to share it with us at hashtag fault lines at the end of today's program. So buckle up and open up initially to James Ford and Eli Portillo, who first met in 2014 in Leaders Under 40, Class 4. We're here, Trade Street, kind of right near the Five Points area, and we're really at the intersection of a lot of forces colliding. We've got gentrification, we've got looking out, I see new skyscrapers, new five, six hundred thousand dollar houses next to um, families and places where people uh, have been renting for a long time, and it's really just um, kind of emblematic of what we're seeing in Charlotte. In every major American city, you have similar stories. Uh, in Charlotte, this particular corridor was once redlined, right? In other words, it was marked off and essentially symbolizing to investors, do not invest here. And it's purely because of the racial composition of the neighborhood. Now what we're seeing happening is that, you know, investors are coming back into those areas now that the uh, land values have been depressed and they're starting to develop it. These are becoming hot spots, hot areas. But what happens is the black communities that lived here for generations are missing out on that wealth. And subsequently, you have what is systemic racism, a socially engineered mechanism for denying and stripping whole generations of black people of wealth. Yeah, so the Urban Institute project, um, I think, really exemplifies some of CBI's goals and missions, uh, especially around knowledge. You know, we're really about equipping people with the knowledge to understand what's going on in their community, what's driving it, and uh, what the impacts are, not just at a, a surface level, but at a, a really deep level. And in the case of the racial wealth gap, that's multi-generational. That, plays out from the Jim Crow era back to slavery, and there's direct connections to what we're seeing now. Can you tell me a little about why you think it's important that people get the knowledge to you know, wake up, interrupt, step up, and uh, affect real change? You can't begin to figure out how to be part of the uh, solution if you don't understand the root of the problems. And when we see things like poverty and when we see subsequent features like you know, crime, we don't often under, understand what are like the causal factors behind that. And do you think that we are, um, you know, really doing a, a good enough job of equipping people to understand what's going on? Because as I look around, you know, where we are right now, mm -hmm. I don't just see uh, real estate values and home prices and those kind of market-based numbers. I see stories of past discrimination. Yeah. I see stories of marginalized communities. I see also stories of hope, yeah. but a lot of that goes under the surface and people don't, don't understand that. How do you see the fault lines in Charlotte maybe being repaired a little bit? It takes us honoring what's in the ground. You know what I mean? For a lot of people this year, the protest, the, the pandemic and the way that it has disproportionately impacted certain communities, the knowledge of deeply systemic racism has shifted the tectonic plates right underneath. Uh, for a lot of, mm -hmm. for a lot of folks and so and that's uh, when you feel those earthquakes absolutely absolutely like it has shaken up the world of a lot of people some people live on the fault lines like they live on the San Andreas right <laughs> and so their worlds are constantly being shaken up and the knowledge of that and not just the, these fault lines but other ones within community that you may not see just on the surface we're gonna have to start building that into our systems so that they become more durable so that when things like what we're witnessing come along we don't sweep them under the rug and dismiss those because real people, real lives are impacted by that. And um, if, if something shakes up one community, we should feel the reverberations and the aftershocks in other communities in a way that push us into action. But you gotta recognize where those fault lines exist. Mm -hmm. My discussion with James highlights the importance of having knowledge about the issues affecting our community. Now, let's go to Bishop Tanya Rawls to hear about some skills we can use to affect change. Good morning. 
My name is Bishop Tanya Rawls, and I am founder and executive director of the Freedom Center for Social Justice, located in Charlotte, North Carolina, and also pastor of Sacred Souls United Church of Christ. I am so grateful to have an opportunity to be here with you this morning to talk about social justice and the ways that inequities can show up in our community. One of the things that I have learned as I think about reflections in reference to my life in Charlotte and also some of the national work that I do around culture shifts is how important it is for us to think about invisible lines that are also often there, these fault lines that are present in ways that we sometimes are impacted and don't even realize we're being impacted. It becomes so vital that we start with the self, that any kind of actual change that is to happen, it's going to happen as we begin looking at our own selves, at our own biases, at our own challenges. And a lot of that is framed by our history, how we grew up, where we grew up, what were the lessons that we learned, but also something a little less obvious, and that is those things that we get rewarded for and things that we also get punished for. I'm often asked, well, I get it, Bishop Rawls, I'm ready to start work, I'm ready to move, I see these injustices, I see the challenges that are within our community. How do I even get started? And what kind of skills do I need in order to help in ways that I'm not getting in the way or impeding progress, but I'm actually a part of the solution? I always encourage people to just start right where you are. Sometime it's about starting right at your dinner table. In other instances, it's about broadening that conversation because many of you who will watch this video are individuals who are leaders, who are leading sometimes 10 people and in other instances, thousands of people. What I always encourage people to do is use that which you are most familiar with as your starting point. Own the fact that there is personal work that you also may need to do so that you can have an opportunity to see what are the internal things that I may have that even when I get skills may not allow those skills to be used most effectively. Lastly, I will say, just think about what you would want for your own family. Would you want your own family to be safe? Would you want your own family to have free and access to the things that help them live the best, strongest life. At the end of the day, other skills are strong communication skills. And when I say communication skills, I'm not saying that you have to have every verb, verb and adjective lining up with one another. What I'm saying is, are you able to just start a conversation, sometime as simple as a cup of coffee, in other instances, at a conference that you're hosting? The bottom line is, it begins with relationship. People often wonder, how have you been able to make such progress, Bishop Rawls, in these complicated relationships with the civil rights community and the LGBTQ community, or black folk and white folk? And what I say is, we build relationships. I am often asked, where do I find hope? Where do I find courage to do this culture shift work that I've been engaged in for 20 years now? And what I often say is that I stay amazed. I stay amazed by community. I stay amazed by our possibilities. And among those things are the things I've learned as I work at intersections that some would view the most difficult, where actually I have found the greatest progress when I'm going to those who are often least like me and least like those that I serve. Does it take courage? A little. Um, but what happens when we come together and when we talk about the needs that exist in our community, when we can find common ground, I have actually found that it is those that are seemingly farthest away from me that we can do the most amazing work. So what I know is the work that CBI is doing is worth us all investing in. And the things that we have an opportunity to learn, let us learn by stretching out and looking at what is working and glean from those spaces. I want to thank you so much for this opportunity to talk to you and to share just a few of the learnings I've had over these years of working on culture shift. We can do this, Charlotte, and I'm excited to be a part of that solution. Thanks so much for joining this breakfast. I really admire what CBI is doing, which is why I'm here. And I admire your effort to try to build a sense of community at a time when this coronavirus makes it so difficult. Uh, and if people are 
always, I think, a little surprised that a New York Times columnist should be interested in issues of grassroots community building. And let me tell you how that came about. So I grew up in a rural area in Oregon, in a small town called Yamhill, that was very proud of its social fabric and of its upward mobility. It had done very well. A uh, working class area, but union jobs would repel people upward. And then in the 1990s, those jobs went away and uh, meth came in. And a quarter of the kids on my old school bus are now dead from uh, drugs, alcohol, and suicide, what are called deaths of despair. And uh, to help those kids on my bus, we needed better policies. We needed uh, better efforts at the federal, state, and grassroots level to support them. You know, the kids who got on the bus right after me, it was the NAP family, the five NAP kids. Um, all five of the NAP kids, four boys and one girl, are now gone from um, basically drugs and alcohol. We as a society spent an enormous amount of time incarcerating my friends, the NAPs. We, if that same money had been spent educating them, supporting them with social services, providing drug treatment, building a sense of community, then they would be alive, their kids and grandkids would be in better shape. And yet we didn't, we didn't do that. And that's why I believe in community institutions. Um, we need better policies, but to get there, we often need a better, a better, uh, a better sense of community institutions. You know, in many ways, this year has been a particularly difficult year for all of these long-term inequities and injustices in the U.S. Uh, uh, aside from uh, the central economic inequity that the top one percent uh, has more wealth than the bottom ninety percent. We now have a situation in which um, the, uh, the, the wealthiest Americans have been able to magnify uh, that wealth, uh, and those at the bottom have been risking their lives and dying at hugely unequal shares. And so I mentioned the need for better policies, but you know I think that also what we need is better narratives, and that also is, I think, what happens at a community level. In America, over the last 50 years, we've become absorbed with the idea that it's all about personal responsibility. Personal responsibility is real, and I don't want to take away their sense of agency. But if we're going to have that conversation, let's also have a conversation about our collective social responsibility. Um, when you can make a projection about where a kid will end up based on the zip code that they are born in, you know, when children in three U.S. counties uh, are born with a lower life expectancy than children born in Bangladesh or Cambodia. That's not because those infants are making bad choices. It's because we as a country are making bad choices. And so, sure, let's have a conversation about personal responsibility, bad, bad, bad choice. Let's also, though, look in the mirror as a community, as a country, and look at the need to provide more opportunity. And, you know, I'm... I'm optimistic. Uh, I do think that we have the policies, we have the we have the tools to address our problems. We have uh, the resources to address them. What we've lacked is the political will. This year, maybe the the, the suffering in the U.S. from the pandemic, uh, the toxicity of the political campaign, has underscored to all of us. Uh, how important it is that we do move forward, that we provide new and better narratives, that we provide greater opportunity for all Americans. And every election year is a chance to start again. Uh, so I just want to salute you all for your efforts to build community in Charlotte, to change narratives, provide more opportunity, and help make this a better community and country. Thanks so much. We have all shared the stories, spoken the words about the communities, the neighborhoods that once were Brooklyn, the people who are actively being displaced, Cherry. We harp on the memories, give love and light to their legacies. We prepare for the catastrophe that almost always comes with being erased. 
a fault is a fracture or disruption in the planet's surface. It's where the movement and displacement occurs. A fault line holds on to the pressure. It's holding everything together until the tension becomes so great that it literally rocks the earth causes a convulsion, an earthquake, a tsunami, a disaster of grave proportions. It's the tiny cracks that form lines of division that create the disasters that result in disruption. And we speak their stories, tell the tales of the people and families that once occupied this land, Catawba, Sugary, name whole towns after them, Waxall, and roads and streets, Tuckasegee. We wade in their water, Sugar Creek, have benefited from their traditions, a good old Southern city where the living is easy. We forge forward in the name of urban renewal, with trains and tracks that slice through entire neighborhoods, Optimus Park, that displace whole families and generations of people who have lived and worked there, Enderly Park. We uproot stories and history without a second thought of the experiences and memories created by the people who built their communities with creativity and care, Wilmore. And every time that the people are erased, Brook Hill, families are left out in the cold Biddleville, beneath the surface Lockwood, beyond the visible small wood, a crack is exposed. The plates begin to shift. Nature is taking its course. You cannot think that you can disregard the most vulnerable yet resilient of your city and not be met with a catastrophic force and not come face to face with the consequences of your actions. When what is in the ground can stay there no more, the people erupt, movements happen, perspectives shift, cities shake, lives are changed and earths will quake. We speak their stories, discuss with candor how they can no longer afford to live there now, Noda, about how their homes are purchased for pennies and torn down and rebuilt First Ward, turn what meant something valuable to somebody's grandma, Greer Heights, into condos and townhomes, half a million dollar builds, Seversville. Disregard the irony of stripping yet another people from their home. Another crack reveals itself from beneath the surface. Another black community erased and displaced. A city with a crisis of consciousness. Another neighborhood goes up for purchase. Another family out on the streets. Ousted to the outskirts of the city or to the places without access. Now those who can't afford it are privileged to live in the ugly houses turned to pretty, the fault lines exposed. What a beautiful mess. We tell the stories of the city as we work for better days and respond with hope and courage. We fight injustice, but we cannot ignore the cracks that have always existed beneath the surface. And if we are to prevent greater disaster, if we are to save our communities while there is still time, we must go back to the difficult truths that exist beneath us. We must follow the stories through the fault lines. What gives me courage is when I see other people living their most authentic lives. Um, And it's why I'm so excited to be part of LU40 this year because I'm surrounded by dozens of wonderful Charlotteans who are living out their personal missions, um, doing what's right because it's the right thing to do, and really eager and inspired to learn about how to better themselves and better our community. I've witnessed the resilience of young people from pre-K to eighth grade and of teachers as they overcome the challenges of teaching and learning remotely. I'm encouraged by their steadfastness and commitment to academic and social emotional growth, the latter of which is needed now more than ever. But it's listening to student discourse, even through Zoom, that gives me the most hope. Our young folks are aware of our country's challenges. They're tuned in to the barriers that exist even here in Charlotte. Most importantly, though, they're determined to work harder than ever to acknowledge what's in the ground and to work diligently to build a better tomorrow for us all. The world that 
uh, we live in now doesn't afford us the luxury of choosing whether or not we're going to be courageous. Being courageous is a mandate now. It's not a choice. And being a leader um, in Charlotte and a member of this community, it is my duty to speak up and step up and interrupt when things um, that I see are unjust or not right. And in order for us to set examples for other members of our community, for our classmates, for our children, um, then we need to know that when it's time to step up, we must have the courage to do so. I found my courage to interrupt and step up to champion equal rights and equity through knowledge, skills, and vocabulary that I was able to develop during my time in the Leaders Under 40 program. I may speak from my I, but my courage comes from the we and the community that we all share. Courage to stand up for what's right and take action for change for a more equitable Charlotte Mecklenburg and beyond. I'm so proud to share this platform with an amazing group of individuals who are collectively making an impact to our community. It gives me hope to see and be a part of a community dedicated in making Charlotte a better place. Most importantly, it gives me hope to see the younger generation taking the initiative in making sure their voices are being heard to provoke change in different avenues. What brings me hope as a native Charlotte team is that there are many young professionals willing to put themselves in positions to better our community. I find hope and knowing that more conversations are taking place in our current times than ever before in our nation's history on our implicit biases and the impact that those incorrect narratives have on our institutions, businesses, and society. I find hope in how many citizens have heard the fear and pain of those brave enough to share their stories and pledge to make real changes going forward. I know that these can sometimes seem like small efforts. But those are the seeds of the fruit that bends the arc of the moral universe towards justice. And in that, I find hope. Wow. The words that we have heard today crystallize the vital import of individuals and, inst and institutions leading with hope and courage. Soren Kierkegaard has defined hope as a passion for the possible. In the midst of what would cause despair, hope is the ability to see possibility of an alternate future. It's what Dr. King voiced in terms of hewing out a stone of hope from a mountain of despair. Such hewing calls for moral clarity, the ability to know the right answers to the right questions, recognizing, acknowledging issues for what they truly are and how our individual and collective values apply to them. The clarity is never enough. One person has correctly said, your moral compass can only point you in the right direction. It can't make you go there. To go there, to lead there, to sit there, to sacrifice there, yes, even to suffer there, requires courage. The ability to overcome the fear and intimidation which would keep you from choosing and doing the right thing. It's leading with hope in the midst of fault lines that shake and shift requires, yes, clarity and courage, but it needs one other thing, capacity. In looking at the construction guidelines and standards of San Francisco, I discovered, wow, prerequisites that include geoseismic studies as well as vibration monitoring and vibration control plans, that the laying of pipe and the driving of piles prohibits the use of high frequency or sonic equipment due to the sensitivity of the plates. I was struck by how necessary the knowledge of what to employ, what not to employ, how to employ, and when to employ is. And as those are necessary for the construction of a building on sensitive and shifting plates, they're equally, if not more necessary, for the building of community whose plates are sensitive and shifting. Leaders must have the sensibility and the strength to stand and not shrink in the midst of the shift and sway of fault lines. 
CBI helps intensify the commitment and increase the capacity of leaders and the institutions they lead in building communities characterized by equity, access, and inclusion. And your support of CBI helps in this worthwhile work. All those cranes that are going up in the sky, buildings that are coming out of the ground, they are wonderful. But how much more wonderful is it for them to be in a community governed by equity, justice, and fairness? Your support of CBI makes that happen. And so you can safely donate online by visiting cbicharlotte.org backslash donate and you'll find multiple options for investing in the work. Now I want to present Diane English. <laughs> oh gracious, it's always such a privilege to follow Bishop Claude Alexander. It's a little intimidating but it's a gift. Um, in just a moment, you'll be moved into a breakout room to have a smaller group conversation, a virtual version of the table conversations that are such a hallmark of previous CBI stakeholder breakfasts. As always, there will definitely not be enough time, but the discussions can continue, especially since we've prepared a downloadable conversation guide with both the questions and some insights into fault lines and how they illuminate issues of equity and inequity in our community. You will have about 15-ish minutes to talk and listen, and there will be a moderator waiting for you. Then you'll be back with us for a very few brief remarks and a special gift. If for some reason your room does not have a moderator, we hope that someone will step up and do the honors. Enjoy one another and see you soon. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the conversations around your virtual table. The energy in this room was amazing. And I know that the, the sessions that we've seen and enjoyed have taught us all something that we can take with us. I encourage each of you to keep these conversations going by using the CBI conversation card you downloaded or find it on our website. Also, if you've been doodling on your agenda placemat, Snap a picture and post it on our social media using hashtag fault lines. I realize that Rick and I stand between you and the world premiere of the original song Fault Lines by Ultima, Ultima Nota. You don't want to miss it, trust me. But before we welcome them, let us share a few of the ways CBI can support you as you build on today's experiences. Visit our Things to Do page on CBI's website to connect, explore, read, and share. To connect, register to join a virtual Fault Lines conversation in January, February, or March. You can also sign up to participate in an equity impact circle beginning in January. To explore, check out our CBI Curiosity Tour launched this year during the pandemic which takes you into Charlotte's center city, the east side, and the west side to explore pieces of our history and our current day places of interest. Plus, everyone attending today's breakfast will receive a voucher so that while you're on the CBI Curiosity Tour, you can visit Pauline's Tea Bar on the west side or Manolo's Bakery on the east side and support one of the many uh, black and brown owned businesses in Charlotte, courtesy of CBI. Now, over to you, Rick. Thanks, Byron. Those are great suggestions for our guests to get involved with CBI. In addition to connecting and exploring, I'd like to invite all of you to read. Pick up a copy of Nicholas Kristof's latest book, Tightrope, and sign up on CBI's website, cbicharlotte.org, to join a CBI-hosted conversation with Mr. Kristoff on February 9th. And finally, share. 
please consider joining the CBI family or renewing your connection with CBI by making a financial gift. You can donate online at cbicharlotte.org backslash donate, where there are multiple options for giving. A recurring gift is a great way to give throughout the year. And of course, please let us know if your employer offers matching gifts. Once again, thank you so much to our sponsors and the many other donors for making today possible. A special thanks to our 2020 Stakeholders Breakfast planning team and the leadership of Kendall Phillips, Eli Portillo, and Tom Zwang. And of course, to the CBI team of staff, faculty, and specialists who are able to bring CBI's work to life each and every day. Now, please enjoy Ultima Nota and their original song, Fault Lines. Dancing is definitely encouraged. And what do they say? Dance like no one is watching? Today is definitely the day for that. And be thankful that there is no ballroom, escalator, or parking deck to navigate as we close today's event. So please stay connected and enjoy the performance. And don't forget to send CBI your photos or tag us on social media using hashtag fault lines. Thank you. Hey guys, so we are so happy and, and grateful to be here. Thank you CBI for the invitation. So now this song, um, we wrote it for this event. We, we loved it very much. It's called Fault Lines. Um, so check it out, sing it along with us, and uh, we hope you like it. strange, no one can feel the love I'm trying to find the common place Get my feet on the ground But there's nothing i found I hear my neighbor complaining Can't understand what is going on in his face, he shows weary from the news that he heard. He can relate to the world. Tratando de acercarme, pregunto como está. Con paciencia me empezó a contar. What can we do when the ground shakes up? We run, we run and look for shelter Come lend a hand We're all in need, just look around It's you and me, we're all standing on social fault lines Walk the streets in my city I hear the sirens coming They're coming round the band And there's a woman that's screaming To a corner store clerk She can't relate to the world Tratando de acercarme Pregunto que pasó Se ha calmado un poco y me contó What can we do When the ground shakes around us We run, we run and look for shelter Come lend a hand We're all in need, just look around It's you and me, we're all standing on social fault lines
the ground shakes around us We run, we run and look for shelter Come lend a hand We're all in need, just look around It's you and me, we're all standing on social Don't fall back.